Thank you all for coming out on a Friday. It's very lovely out. I think most of you would be maybe preferring to do other things and hearing about the Pakistan Army, but hopefully by the end you'll be uh, a little bit uh, interested in what's going on with the Pakistan Army. Let me tell you um, a little bit about my background. I'm actually not a political scientist, so I approach these puzzles from a different point of view. So I did my PhD in South Asian languages and civilizations. And so in my training, texts are very important. And so when I, when I began this project, um, I, I approached it from a very different empirical optic. And, and I hope that sort of comes through um, in, in the analysis that I'm gonna present. One of the things, and I'm very nearsighted, so it's hard for me to read this, and I can't, I don't have eyes in the back of my head, so I'm gonna try to uh, make it do. One of the things that, that really struck me when I was a young analyst at the RAND Corporation and was uh, tasked with looking at some of these defense issues is that if you were to create a game called India in Pakistan and you basically, kind of like Dungeons and Dragons, I know I just age myself, I'm not sure what the youngsters play now, uh, but if you just had a set of objectives, India wants to achieve this, Pakistan wants to achieve that, and here's the tools that each state has to accomplish these objectives, the 14-year-old that got stuck playing Pakistan would simply give up and go do something else. Because a 14-year-old, looking at the objectives and looking at the, the means and resources would understand that Pakistan can't achieve what it wants to achieve. And yet Pakistan continues to persist in, in doing what it's doing. And what do I mean by persist? Well, for those, I'm assuming that most of you have some sort of South Asia background. Anyone not know the origins of the India-Pakistan dispute? Anyone not know of Kashmir? It's okay if you don't. You don't know about Kashmir. Okay, well, I'm good. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So, so hang on, don't, don't worry, we're gonna get there, so bear with me. Um, one of the first things that Pakistan and India do when, when the two states become independent, when the Brits decolonize South Asia in 1947, in 48, is that they go to war. And they go to war because Pakistan was trying to seize Kashmir. Uh, why did Pakistan wanna seize Kashmir? Well, Pakistan's um, founders, promoted this notion of a two-nation theory. And the two-nation theory held that um, Muslims and Hindus are separate but equal nations. Now, many Pakistanis will learn in their schools that the two-nation theory meant that there had to be a separate independent state for Muslims. I mean, unfortunately, like many things that Pakistanis learn in their schools, that's what's called a fiction or, or less generously a lie. Um, in fact, Jinnah had put forward this idea in hopes that he could secure equal um, seats in a federal parliament of United India for, India, for, for India's Muslims and Hindus. And the Indian National Congress, which became the party that, began, that, that led India, said, you've got to be crazy. Um, you're a fraction of our population. Why should you get the, the equivalent number of seats in a parliament? And when they could not come to some concession about what a constitutional dispensation would look like for United India, and fearing that the British would back away from their decision to decolonize, basically the Indian National Congress said, fine, go have your Pakistan. And so the two-nation theory then became the justification for this independent state. And I'm happy to talk more about that for those of you that know a little bit about the two-nation theory. Kashmir was the only Muslim dominant geography in South Asia. So Pakistan felt that because it was the home of South Asia's Muslims, that it had some right uh, to Kashmir. Uh, the K, for example, in Pakistan stood for Kashmir. But they didn't have a legal standing for Kashmir. It turns out there were three princely states. Um, they uh, were allowed to decide whether they would go with India or Pakistan. And Kashmir was one of those states, and its sovereign did not want to join either India or Pakistan. He was holding out for independence. So as it became apparent that Pakistan would not get Kashmir, Pakistan began its first use of non-state actors by mobilizing tribal lushkars. Um, when I talk to American audiences, we call that a posse. I don't know what Europeans call a lushkar. Um, any, good, any good translation for a posse to a European audience? Hordes? <laughs> maybe, maybe hordes, I'm not sure. Um, basically, well, we'll use the word that they initially used was marauders. So um, contrary to Pakistan's preferred story that these were non-state actors, they were not non-state actors. They enjoyed tremendous support from the provincial governments of what was then the Northwest Frontier Province. 
as well as the Punjab province. The military gave them fuel and vehicles. And eventually, of course, the state itself began supplying these marauders. As the marauders um, converged um, near Srinagar, and they probably would have gotten to Srinagar had they not been more interested in raping and pillaging, uh, the sovereign of Kashmir asked India for help. Notably, he had signed a standstill agreement with Pakistan. So Pakistan is in violation of the standstill agreement. He asked India for military help. India says, we'll do that on the agreement that you accede to India. So he signs the accession instrument. And as the accession instrument is being ferried to Delhi, India airlifts troops. So essentially what India is doing is airlifting troops now to defend its sovereign territory. Once this happens, Pakistan's army officially becomes involved. I, I want to point out that in the beginning, a low level, a mid, not low level, a mid-level munitions officer is actually the pioneer of this fiasco. He, he, he starts out as a major. By the time it's done, you know, he's basically a chief emperor field marshal. I mean, the ability with which he could uh, inflate his title is really quite remarkable, given the duffer that he was. Um, nonetheless, this becomes the first India-Pakistan conflict. When this conflict ends, about one-third of Kashmir is under Pakistani control, and two-thirds is under Indian control. So this first four-way, you could say, was successful, right? Had they not launched these marauders, Pakistan would have no part of Kashmir. The second time, they, they basically do a similar strategy. Um, they use non-site actors in 1965, and they're fortified with regular uh, and irregular military and paramilitary troops. And this emerges, or this morphs into the second Indo-Pakistan War of 1965. What we now know is that had India had better civil military coordination, and they um, had the army chief not erroneously reported that they were out of ammunition when they weren't, uh, India could have prosecuted that war, taken Delhi, and delivered a decisive defeat, defeat to Pakistan. Generally, this is considered to be a stalemate. But since Pakistan started the war, and since Pakistan achieved none of its objectives, it's kind of a, it's a puzzle. Pakistan does this again in 1999, right? Um, this time it's actually using paramilitary disguised as Mujahideen. But it's basically you know, the same strategy. Send a people in, we're lying about their identities, try to affect a territorial, a territorial status quo. But in this case, they're, they're, they're defeated. The, the troops are actually repelled. Pakistan is at this point an international pariah. In addition, to these three wars over Kashmir, Pakistan was also decisively defeated in 1971 when a civil war, when India intervened in a civil war and uh, essentially broke up Pakistan. Pakistan in 1947 had a west wing and it had an east wing. So after this war, Pakistan had lost half of its population and half of its territory. So by any definition, this was clearly a defeat. In addition to this, Pakistan has waged a proxy war. Now we can talk about what a proxy war is and at what point um, just simply engaging in nuisance value, sabotage, and terrorism campaign, which Pakistan did since 1947, at what point do we call this a proxy war? But Pakistan had been doing that since 1947. The nature of it changes substantively in 1990 when Pakistan takes these battle-hardened mujahideen, for, for lack of a better word, and sends them to Kashmir. All right, so we have this interesting question. Pakistan keeps banging its head against this wall over subsequent decades. It, it's got multiple you know, goose eggs, and it's not achieving its objectives. Worse, in doing so, Pakistan is, in fact, imperiling the very viability of the state. Why do I say that? Who knows about the Pakistan Taliban, right? All right, so Pakistan loves to say, how can we be supporters of terrorism when we're victims of terrorism? And then comes the magical number generator, 60,000, 70,000 Pakistanis have been killed. By the way, none of these numbers are verifiable independently. They just pull numbers out of some orifice for the purposes of rent seeking. Um, but indeed, Pakistanis have died in large number. And I don't, whether it's 13,000 um, or 60,000, the number is probably closer to 13,000 than 60,000. But let's not diminish those numbers. But let's also be very clear that there would be no Pakistan Taliban if Pakistan had not cultivated a veritable petting zoo of terrorists, right? So the groups that became the Pakistan Taliban were the proxies that Pakistan raised to prosecute this insurgency in Kashmir. So what we would call this, of course, is blowback. What's actually kind of interesting in Pakistan's case is that many states that engage in proxy and supporting proxies experience blowback much earlier than Pakistan did. Pakistan's been doing this for decades, and it's only in the last 11 years or so 
where these proxies are imperiling the very viability of the state. So political scientists, and again, I'm not one, so that's another safari for me, it's how political scientists think about this issue. Um, we generally expect states to abandon or at least modify strategies that don't work. And we certainly expect them to get rid of strategies that imperil the very viability of the state itself. Yet Pakistan doesn't do this. And this is something um, that had been quite curious to me for quite some time. So I've been working on this book, collecting data for decades, and I'll talk to you <laughs> literally decades. So I'll talk to you in a few minutes about, about the data. So um, what I find at the end of this is that not only has Pakistan not even remotely considered abandoning its revisionism, in recent decades, its revisionism has actually expanded. It's not just about Kashmir anymore. So in other words, if the border ferry came down and said, here's a territorial dispensation that you can both live with, go forth and prosper, Pakistan would still be a menace. And the reason for that is, is that Pakistan is ideologically opposed to India that Pakistan's concerns with India are not strictly speaking or even mostly security driven. And what Pakistan mostly sees itself trying to do is retard India's rise. So when I talk about some of the data sources that I'm gonna use in this book, <clears throat> mostly I'm using Pakistan's own military journals. And they will say things like, even after the 1971 war, we were not defeated because we lost half of our country to a much larger military, and yet we're the only one in South Asia that can challenge India's rise. We're the only ones that can resist India's hegemony. So not only does Pakistan have territorial issues with India over Kashmir, which I'm going to argue are ideological, not security driven, what Pakistan really wants to do um, is assert its equality with India. And, and this is, of course, a preposterous thing for Pakistan to do. So the question is, why in the world does it do this? So the conventional wisdom is that Pakistan does this because it's a security-seeking state. Now, this is sort of interesting from a Washington point of view, and I think the EU has a similar optic. And this is that if Pakistan does these things because it feels insecure, we can do things to make it secure. Now, speaking as an American who has largely subsidized this, this terrorist military, um, my country takes a lot of responsibility for this because our logic is that there's some number of F-16s, there's some amount of foreign military sales, there's something we can do to buttress Pakistan's conventional weaknesses so that it feels more confident about India, such that it can resolve this territorial dispute on terms that it feels comfortable with, this gives rise to a very dangerous thinking about Kashmir of a grand bargain, right? That if the, ter you know, if, the, if the border ferry could again come down, also known as the US State Department, could come up with some sort of territorial dispensation that would be agreeable to both of these places, Pakistan can let go of its terrorist proxies. It no longer has to worry about Afghanistan, and so its support for groups like the Taliban will also go away. And most recently, um, Ahmed Rashid and Barnett Rubin put forward this idea of a grand bargain. We solve Kashmir and we fix Afghanistan. Now, these are not uninfluential fellows. Barnett Rubin was for many years, I think he still is, um, an advisor to the um, SRAP, which is the uh, Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, which is the cell in the State Department that basically mismanages um, the US relationship with Pakistan and Afghanistan. So these are not uninfluential fellows. And every time we get some new aspirant to the White House, they rediscover Kashmir, right? Barack Obama did this. Kashmir is the most dangerous place in the world. He actually wanted to have a special representative to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India until India said, if you do that, we won't give him a visa. And so then Barack Obama you know, backpedaled on that. But Clinton did it, George Bush did it. You know, basically, everyone rediscovers Kashmir. And I argue in the book that this is very, very dangerous thinking for two reasons. One, Pakistan has no claim to Kashmir. And usually at this point, there's some Pakistani dude, but UN Security Council Resolution 48. And that fellow has never read it. I have yet to meet a Pakistani fellow, but UN Security Council Resolution 48, he's never read it. It's always a he, by the way, it's never been a woman. So I'm waiting for that woman to rise up, UN Security Council 48. And I was like, madam, have you read it? And she's gonna say no. And I'll say, well, you have, do you have a smartphone? You can Google it right now and we'll wait because you can read it. Um, so they have no legal claim to Kashmir whatsoever. Any moral claim they had, after all, the Indians are apparently butchering Kashmiris, um, were also vitiated by the fact that they have supported their own butchers, right? So it has no legal claim and it has no moral claim. 
So why are we supporting Pakistan and entertaining equities which it does not legally have? Period, full stop. Second, by treating Pakistan as a security-seeking state, we pursue policies of appeasement. And drawing from the work of Charlie Glazer, who talks about security-seeking states versus ideological states, if you treat an ideological state like a security-seeking state, what you're actually doing is incentivizing the worst behavior. And so what I argue in the book, by everyone, mostly the United States, because we're primarily the biggest enablers of this nonsense, um, we essentially, not only do we enable, but we actually incentivize Pakistan to do the worst of these things. Why do I say incentivize? How does Pakistan continue to extract rents? Right? If it didn't have nuclear weapons, India would have sorted Pakistan out ages ago. Right? The way they keep the American checkbook open is by saying, we are too dangerous to fail. Right? Why are they too dangerous to fail? Because they've cultivated a zoo of snakes, which they hope would only attack their neighbors, but now they are attacking them. And they basically float this idea that the terrorists could get the nuclear weapons. So if you don't keep giving us money, we won't be able to fight our own war on terror, and the nuclear weapons are no longer safe. So in other words, they create a fear about the Islamist barbarians at the nuclear gate as a rent-seeking strategy. And we continue to fall for it. And at the very end, I'm going to talk about how we might pull ourselves out of this coercion loop and expose Pakistan to the real cost of its behavior. So would I argue instead that Pakistan's not a security-seeking state, that it's an ideological state? And this is something we really have to understand. And an ideal, for, for those of you who can't read this, I can't read it either because I'm quite blind. So I'll read it out for you. It should be in Braille. Um, so and this is actually the work of Charlie Glazer. So a purely ideological, what he calls a greedy state, is one that's fundamentally dissatisfied with the status quo, desiring additional territory even when it's not required for security. Nothing defines Pakistan's position on Kashmir more than this statement. This, it, it, it couldn't be more true. Um, and what I'm going to present in this conversation with you is some of the evidence that I have that buttress this claim. What is interesting is that Pakistan could make a security claim. It could say that what's now the line of control separating the two parts of Kashmir should be perhaps reconsidered for tactical defensibility because you know, basically when this line was, was made, it wasn't with consideration of the ridge line. And for those of you who know this topography, it's in the Himalayas. So some of the, the points of the, of the LOC may not make the most defensive sense. It should be perhaps following the ridge line. They could even make an argument about water, right? Because South Asia is having an enormous problem with water scarcity. The Green Revolution um, had many benefits, but one of the downsides was salination of, of the land. And of course, water overuse and misuse is, is rampant. But in all of the six decades of Pakistan military journals that I reviewed, not a single article made a security case for Kashmir. By not a single argument, I mean zero absolutely zero. And to me, this is remarkable. Because if there is any logic for Pakistan not being an ideological state, they should have some understanding of security issues around the territory that they're disputing. But instead, when they talk about Kashmir, they talk about the two-nation theory. They talk about partition not being complete. They talk about um, the... Uh, the, the ideology of Pakistan. And, and, and if you listen to any army chief speech, every army chief has said it, the most recent one, uh, Rahil, Rahil Sharif has said this, they refer to Kashmir as the jugular vein of Pakistan. It is not the jugular vein of Pakistan. Absolutely, it is not the jugular, jugular vein of Pakistan. But this is the narrative that, that, that they promote. And the, the implication is that if I'm right, and that Pakistan's an ideological state and not a security-seeking state, Everything that we have done is essentially we've been throwing ghee onto a fire, right? And if we want Pakistan to behave differently, we have to think very differently about Pakistan. I, I can't speak to EU because EU has a very different relationship with Pakistan than we do. Um, I think the EU and the individual European countries that comprise it have different notions of self. But Americans are obsessed with this idea that we can transform countries. We love this idea that with some amount of USAID, we can transform a problematic state. We love it. And why do we love it? 
because we, it's, we can buy our way out of it, right? This is, and you know, when you have a relatively rich country, we can, th that's a very preferred narrative, that all you have to do is buy your way out of it. And we can't buy our way out of the Pakistan problem. That's fundamentally the argument that I advance in this book. And what I'll say, to sort of give you an amuse-bouche of where I'm gonna conclude with, even if by taking Pakistan off the methadone drip, we may not change Pakistan's behavior but at least we are depriving them of the resources that they rely upon to engage in nuclear proliferation in the expansion of this jihadi project. So we may not change their behavior, but at least we are no longer morally culpable for the things that they do that are so egregious and dangerous and which cause the death of tens of thousands of people um, in South Asia every decade. What do you mean the revisionism? What's the technical meaning of revisionism in your uh, lecture? Yeah, so basically, um, revision means they want to change the territorial status quo, right? Yeah, so everyone understand what I mean by revisionism? Um, now, there's other kinds of revisionism. So India is territorially status quo. It's mildly revisionist in the international system in the sense that it wants to be seen as an, a rising international power and an extra regional power. So India is revisionist in the international system but it's status quo with respect to the territory. Pakistan's revisionist with respect to Kashmir, it's also revisionist in the sense that India is already an extra regional player. That's a fact. And Pakistan wants to retard that. Pakistan wants to keep, South Asia, keep India a South Asian power. Pakistan wants to be seen as India's equal, and it wants to be treated as India's equal. Most importantly, it wants India to see and treat Pakistan as such. Does everyone sort of understand the different notions of revisionism that I'm using here. So the methods that I'm using, um, and again, as I told you, I'm not a political scientist. So I had originally approached this project in a related methods, but my political science friend said, if you want to get tenure, <laughs> you might want to make this look like a political science book. Hint, hint, wink, wink, and I, and I am a trained monkey. So I said, sure, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So it turns out that political science does have a strategic culture literature. And it's actually very similar to the culture literature that I engaged um, as a PhD student in South Asian languages and civilizations. And, um, and I'm going to be using, and it also turns out that many political scientists hate this concept of a strategic culture. And I, and I kind of understand why. Um, in the idea, what strategic culture basically says is that, remember going back to the 14-year-old game of playing India and Pakistan? that you're gonna make, so a non-strategic culture argument would say, you are looking at the costs and benefits of a set of decisions without the weight of your history or culture, right? So in other words, you're not thinking about sunk costs of all the people that have died in Kashmir, right? You're just thinking about what are the marginal costs and benefits of making a decision right now? And what strategic culture arguments say is that all of these decisions that you make, how you evaluate costs and how you evaluate benefits, are imbricated with your sense of culture, your sense of history. To me, it seems very obvious that I spent my PhD in South Asian languages and culture, so obviously I think this is important, but many political scientists don't. And one of their pr principal problems is that they love dependent variables and uh, independent variables. Y'all go through the whole DV, IV stuff? Who has not suffered dependent variable and independent variable abuse? <laughs> Right. Well, I love political scientists because you know what? They, they reduce things to these truisms that are not true, and then they debate basic non-truths amongst themselves for the purposes of generating publications that no one reads or cites. It's like the best shell game ever. I love it, and I have to learn to play it. So don't tell anyone I gave away the secret. So their concern is that the dependent variable, right, which is something that state a state does, should be predicted by a strategic culture independent variable, right? and that these variables should be completely isolable. Well, the real world, anyone who does any regression, you know, endogeneity is like gravity, it exists. So of course it's gonna exist in a problem like this. So again, political scientists can grouse about endogeneity, we didn't make it up, we just have to you know, push it under the rug and, and just acknowledge it. So it's very difficult to live up to the standard of Alistair Johnston. Um, but I, I use it because he actually has the most operational concept so not only do I use Alistair Johnson's notion of strategic culture, the other thing that I thought was kind of interesting in political science is that political science, um, they tend to assume that a state is revisionist or is not revisionist. And then based upon the shoebox in which the state is stuck, they make predictions about what those states will do. 
They, they are very lazy when it comes to theorizing why a state stays revisionist or why a state might become revisionist or why a state that was revisionist might stop being revisionist. They, they tend to assume these static positions and make assumptions. Um, and so this is a problem because it doesn't explain why Pakistan stays revisionist when many of the theorems that political scientists put forward suggest that, well, maybe they shouldn't have, right? So I came across this one fellow, Zions, and he actually did wrestle with why a state engages in what he calls persistent revisionism. Actually, he calls it unreasonable revisionism, which is a term I don't much care for. Um, and so I'm going to be putting together these, these two concepts to try to explain what Pakistan does and why. So the data, let me talk to you a little bit about the data. I've spent a lot of time in Pakistan. I can't go now. I'm very much blacklisted. Um, to give you a sense of how lovely the ISR, the ISI, which is Pakistan's intelligence agency, ladies, this is for you, they threatened me with gang rape by an entire regiment. Really? Yes, really. They are complete Kaminas, for those of you who know Urdu. Yeah, so that's really nice. So my question was, is it infantry or cavalry? Because it will affect my qualitative and quantitative gang rape experience. So um, I cannot go to Pakistan um, <laughs> anymore. They won't give me a visa. And if they did, I'd be afraid that Lashkar Jungvi would kidnap me, sell me to Al Qaeda, and put me in a beheading video. Um, but of all the years that I spent in Pakistan talking to Pak Mill, it's actually a very limited utility, to be blunt. Why? Because they lie, right? They lie. Um, all militaries lie. My military lies. Um, anyone go on with these little NATO fam tours to convince you that we were winning in Afghanistan? We'll see. We all lie. Um, and the Pakistan army is certainly no exception. So what you get, and here's the other thing about being a girl, um, and I'm saying girl deliberately. Um, they think you're stupid. Oh, you don't know the difference between an artillery shell and a bullet. And so they'll talk about you in front of you in Urdu without the assumption that you know Urdu. Um, or they wouldn't get the brief that I could read or do. So when they took me down to South Waziristan and they told me that we were going to Kari Hussein's hideout and there was no evidence of Kari Hussein anywhere on the wall, but they were like Commander Knucklehead, Commander Bonehead, but no Commander Kari Hussein. Um, they're like, Madam, you can read Pashto. I said, well, this isn't actually Pashto. This is just a script. <laughs> so I, I will say that in all the years I spent time with Pak Mill, um, it was always interesting to hear the lies that they wanted us to believe, right? So there is some utility in knowing the fiction that we're supposed to buy. But what was always most interesting was every once in a while when you would get like a, usually a major, because it, it, if you interact with someone from the Pac Mill, um, and you know this, they've already been read the brief. And there's always anyone, so a lot of you are from South Asia. Do you guys know how, how India manages its monkey problem? They have the Langur Sena. You guys know that reference? You know what a langur is? It's a bigger monkey. So this is, so basically I call the ISI the langurs, right? Because if any, any of the bunders get out of line, the langur whacks them. And they're afraid of the langurs. So um, if, if they're interacting with a foreigner, and there's always an ISI minder, always, they will land themselves in some serious trouble if they're off the briefing book. So every once in a while, you'll be in a situation where you'll be with someone who didn't get the brief and didn't know what he was supposed to say. And that, that would always be an interesting glimpse um, into what was actually going on. Like I remember on that same trip when I went to South Waziristan, we, we first flew into North Waziristan and then South Waziristan by Hilo. And um, because I am a female and I spoke Urdu, they let me sit in the jump seat and I got to uh, listen to the pilot's conversation in the, head, in the, in the headset. And when, and I didn't say anything, I was just listening. So once we crossed the Indus on our way back to Islamabad, one of the pilots said, Mashallah, Indus Pargia. You know, thank God we've crossed the Indus. And so once we landed, I asked the pilot, I said, and he was kind of embarrassed that I heard him say this. I said, so um, why did you say, thank God we, we crossed the Indus? And he sort of explained his terror about how, how when previously, when they would go into Fatah, they had a very different sense, but now they're you know, constantly terrified about what they might encounter. And so he had a very candid discussion about what was going on. And um, so there'd be those moments when going to Pakistan would have some utility, but usually you're at risk <laughs> for no value. So instead, what I rely upon in this book is not decades of wasted um, hours you know, listening to lies, but rather I primarily rely upon their publications. Um, these are publications that are published by General Headquarters. Um, these are conversations that they have amongst themselves for themselves. These are not 
things that we were meant to see, although ironically, Americans have the best archive. Um, I'm sure some European libraries do too, but Pakistan in general has terrible libraries and, and horrible archives. I will say now that they know that people are using these sources, now they're manipulating them. So one of the sources I use is the Pakistan Army Green Book. And once they learned that Americans were interested in this, um, they basically began briefing journalists on them. So I would say now I don't think that publications from say 2014 onward can be used in the same pristine sense because they're now part of Pakistan's psychological operations campaign. They know that people are looking at Halal online. They know people are looking at the Green Book. So they're paying, and they know people are paying attention to the army chief's speeches um, at Kakul and uh, Yom Shah, the, the, the Martyr's Day and so forth. So what is Halal? Halal yeah. is a Pakistan army publication. It's available online. Um, go to ISPR Halal. Um, they, it's, it's in English and it's in Urdu. It Is comes it out. Um, it's intended for them, but now they know that there's a larger um, international audience reading it, and so it's much more prone to, you know, basically planting information. So in other words, when I began this project, no one really knew about these publications, and so they were much more pristine. They were not something that were written to influence American opinion. Um, now that they know people are reading this, they're, they're being much more proactive and making them available. And so I've noticed in the last year or so, since they've known about this growing interest in these publications, that some of their content's changing. Like I was really struck last year, um, and th they, they briefed a bunch of journalists about the new Green Book. Um, and they misrepresented what the Green Book is. And a bunch of these stupid journalists, like, oh, we were just briefed on Pakistan's doctrine. And then they proceeded to say things like how Pakistan has turned a new leaf, they're fighting their own war on terror, and you know, all the rubbish that they're supposed to write. And they dutifully did write that. All right, so basically, this is the stuff that I'm using. Um, I also use, when appropriate, um, militant publications. That's the book I'm working on now. I'm replicating this project. Um, on Lashkar-e Taiba, it's called In Their Own Words. So I've been collecting for decades Lashkar-e Taiba stuff. So anyway, so this project has been ongoing for quite some time. I've been collecting this material since 1998. So it's been it's been a long time in the coming. Okay. So um, let me. I think the best way is to give you this graphic. Um, so this is Zion's framework of why some states. Uh, give up revisionism, which he calls reasonable revisionism, and why some states don't. So he looks at three case studies. He looks at Iran in the Iran-Iraq war. He looks at Iraq in the Iran-Iraq war. Um, he actually calls um, Iraq reasonably revisionist and Iran unreasonably revisionist. And the other example he gives of reasonable revisionism is Israel and Lebanon when it decided that it could no longer get a government there that it wanted. It's not talking about the Israel-Palestine issues, it's talking about a very narrow objective in the Lebanon war. So we can debate how interesting his cases are. But nonetheless, I thought his model had some value. So he's looking at um, what he calls elite ideology and the domestic structure of politics. So when you have an autocratic state, Iran, Iraq, we can debate what Israel is. Um, I'm not a fan of Israel's policy, so you won't, you won't goad me in. Um, I think Bibi is just a menace, and the fact that he went to my Congress really pisses me off. So goad me all you want, I'll probably agree with you. But if the, in the autocratic state, if the elite ideology is pragmatic, it will abandon its revisionism. And this is what he argued happened uh, in Iraq uh, during the Iran-Iraq war. If it's an ideological elite ideology, it will persist in that revisionism. And this is what he gives, the case of that is Iran in the Iran-Iraq war. Democratic states, and he uses Israel in his example, um, if in a democratic political situation, if there's public opposition to the state's policy, they'll abandon the revisionism. If there's public support, they'll persist. Right? That, that might be kind of where we are right now with the whole settlements, right? Because BB seems to have a lot of support for what he's doing. All right, so this has, a, this has a couple of appealing features, but it still doesn't work for the Pakistan case. Because one, these are single plays. Right? These are particular moments in a conflict when the state makes a decision. I have got multiple decisions that I have to, so in other words, I have a cyclical set of decision loops that Pakistan is making. And the other problem is, is that Pakistan is a hybrid regime, right? Sometimes it's clearly autocratic and exclusively autocratic, albeit with a technocratic patina. 
And on other occasions, it looks like a democracy until you, you know, lift up the hood, you're like, oh crap, there's no democracy in there. So Pakistan is a hybrid regime. So what I did was I, I sort of thought about what he was trying to do, and I married it to what Alistair Johnson did. And so this is how I revised uh, this idea of Zion's um, persistent, well, I call it now persistent revisionism um, or abandoned uh, revisionism. So you've got Pakistan's domestic structure. You have direct army rule. And instead of elite ideology, in, in, in Zion's work, for him, it's just an intervening variable. He's not terribly interested in problematizing what that elite ideology is, how it's sustained, how it's produced, how it's consumed, most importantly, how it's diffused. Um, across other regimes or across other stakeholders in the state. For him, it's just an intervening variable. But for me, it's actually a study variable. So I see strategic culture playing that role here. And so when you have direct army rule, if you have an ideological strategic culture, you get this persistent revisionism. If you have a pragmatic strategic culture, you would get this some, if not a complete abandoning of revisionism, some lessening of it. So what would be an example of a pragmatic uh, strategic culture of the Pakistan army. Well, here's a simple one. Economic normalization with India, right? That would be hugely beneficial to Pakistan. What has been very beneficial for India has been its economic reforms so that it can keep its defense expenditures well below 3% of GDP. But because pa uh, India's economy is overall growing, even though they're keeping constant that percentage of GDP, still overall defense expenditures are increasing, right? Well, that's not the case with Pakistan, right? So you could see if there was some pragmatism in how the Pakistan army viewed India, we should expect they should at least support economic normalization for the reasons that I just espoused. But what you see is every time some civilian has tried to, say, offer most favored nation status to India, which India offered to Pakistan actually in the 90s, the army slow rolls it. Um, and how do they do that? By beheading people in Kashmir, for example. So they're not just being obstreperous, they're actually being violent and doing so. Uh, Bo Zardari tried to do this, Nawaz Sharif tried to do this, and both of them ended up in incredibly precarious political situations. So you don't really see a lot of examples of pragmatism in the Pakistan army. So that's why I have that big giant X there. So I argue that strategic culture, based upon this review of the literature, that it's an ideological strategic culture that produces this revisionism. On those occasions when you have an army-controlled democracy, that's what we have right now, as we've had most of the time in Pakistan, you have domestic politics, but they're infused with the army strategic culture. Now, let me unpack this for a little bit. Many people think that this began with Zia al Haq, Pakistan's military dictator who is usually presumed to have driven Pakistan down the cul-de-sac of Islamism. Well, that's a really dangerous misread of Pakistan's history. This actually began with Ayub Khan, Pakistan's first Pakistani military chief and its first military dictator. In the 50s, he says that Pakistan's curriculum should be aligned with its national ideology. He does this in the 50s. Now, what happens when you have a military dictator, they get to choose, for example, who's in the Ministry of Education. Um, remember back in the days of Musharraf, he actually had a former DGISI as the Minister of Education. You know how, how effective that must have been in terms of producing fine quality education coming out of Pakistan schools. Um, not only are they able to do that, they're also able to exercise considerable control over Pakistan's media. Um, it is true that Pakistan has a very diverse private media these days, um, but Pakistan's media, I, I don't know what the European counterparts are, but when I look at someone like Amir Liaquat, I think of him as sort of like Oprah Winfrey, David Duke of the Ku Klux Klan, and um, maybe a televangelist, right? I mean, just really the worst human being wrapped up in infotainment. And he does things like gives out children as gifts, right? He actually had a contest where you could win a child. Oprah just gives you a car. He gives you a child. I mean, you can't make this shit up. Even if you try, it writes itself. So, is he a TV person? Yes, he is. Um, and the old ladies love him. I mean, he's like the Dr. Oz of, of Pakistan. I don't like Dr. Oz either, because he's all the time selling these ridiculous, you know, green tea, melts belly fat, grow a tail if you, you know, drink cacao. I, so he's just like Dr. Oz, but an evil Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz is just a charlatan. This guy is evil. Um, he, for example, um, if whenever there's an Emadiya slaughter, 
Um, these will be one of the clowns that say, well, of course, Ahmadiyyas are wajibul qatl, which means liable to be killed. I mean, this is an actual conversation that happens on Pakistan's media. So when, pa when people talk about Pakistan's media being free, freedom is not always good, um, but they're not really free. They self-police, they self-monitor. Um, it's not uncommon um, when people give an interview to these so-called talk shows that someone will approach them afterwards and say, well, you know, you should really be careful saying what you say. I had my own experience, actually, which I was, I was flabbergasted by. Um, I was doing an interview on CNBC, and the very nice presenter, um, she said to me, why can't you be a partner to us like China? I said, oh, that's a great question. You mean not support you in any war? give you loans instead of aid, and engage in development projects that mostly help us and not you? She cuts me off, <laughs> and she, she went to a commercial break, and she said, you can't talk like this about China. I said, well, then don't ask me stupid questions like this about China, because that's exactly what China is. So I thought that was really interesting that they were even, this is, a pri this is CNBC, right? This is a private television channel. So even she was sensitive to what was said about China. Um, and of course, the biggest myth about China being Pakistan's best friend is a really important myth of the Pakistan army. I mean, if people understood that China's not Pakistan's best friend, um, it, it would be a big problem, I think, for men, many of the myths that they put forward. But, um, and then afterwards, we, we began discussing something anodyne, like my, my liking of chupli kebabs. I mean, that's where the conversation went, China, US, to chupli kebabs. You didn't even want to like, risk you know, pissing me off again. So. Um, so what's been really important to understand is, and this is important because even if we had a pure democracy in Pakistan, which I don't think we'll see for a very long time, it's not clear that the civilians would want something fundamentally different because they have been imbibed with, through the media, through the public school curriculum, through media of, of every possible variety, the treasured and cherished myths of the Pakistan army. So what happens during these periods of domestic politics that are infused with this culture if you have political opposition, there were moments when politicians did things that really pissed off the army. So, for example, um, when Pakistan's foreign minister um, signed the Geneva uh, Convention to end the Afghan war without putting in place any stipulation for an Islamist leader, government was sacked. Nawaz Sharif. Um, wanting to normalize with India in the um, Lahore bus diplomacy, chastising Musharraf for the Kargil war, coup. So there are these episodes where you do get some prime minister with some testicularity, um, and they do what they want to do in violation of the Pakistan army's preferences, but they don't last long. And so that's also a, a warning. And anyone who's watching what Nawaz Sharif has, has done, this is, we're, this is a different kind of army intervention. The army has clipped Nawaz Sharif's wings, and he did, in many ways, challenge the army with this particular rule. But for the most part, what we get is popular and political support for the army's preferences, and this basically results in this persistent revisionism. All right, I'm not gonna go through, this is us. When I was presenting this at Stanford, <laughs> I was very aware that people might not like this uh, framework, so I, I put these slides in just so that they knew I actually did read this stuff. But I don't think we need to belabor this point. You either know these people and like them, or you think they're duffers and useless, and nothing I will say will convince you. I've learned that lesson. But the one thing that I like about Alistair Johnson's concept of strategic culture is the following. Because I think this is, Pakistan is one of the few places where we could do this exercise to the best of his specifications as possible. I'm not saying fully execute it, but we can get pretty close. We want to have an observable, distinct, we want to have um, an observable, observable set of variables that are distinct from these non-strategic cultural variables. So to put it a different way, would I say that the variation in non-strategic culture variables explain best the variation in Pakistan's behavior, or does the variation in these strategic culture variables best explain Pakistan's, the, the variation of Pakistan's behavior? And I'm gonna argue that these strategic cultural vari variables best explain the variation in its behavior. It has to provide decision makers with a uniquely ordered set of strategic choices. So it just can't be a list. There actually has to be an, a rank order of preferences that strategic cultural variables produce. And I, I think we can see that with Pakistan. And it has to be observed in strategic cultural objects. So for me, this was very appealing because that's what my PhD was about, right? Cultural objects. So for me, 
He's talking about speeches, policy documents. Well, Paxton doesn't have policy documents per se, but we do have this a, a enormous body of literature of the army talking to itself, amongst itself, for itself. And then this transmission must be traceable. And again, armies are very good about that. That's what armies do for a living. I mean, armies basically make sausage, right? It doesn't matter what they put in, you get a sausage out. Um, and we can debate about the continuity of that sausage, because armies do change. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But armies are very good in this sense, because they have doctrine. They have schools that indoctrinate. And most importantly, it's like whack-a-mole, right? So if, you, if you're coming up, you're rank of a major, like, you know what, I don't think this jihad in Kashmir is a very good idea. Whack, you're out, right? And the POC military is a womb-to-tomb organization. So the benefits of staying in are really, really high. The benefits of leaving are actually fairly low, right? Because if you make it to be a colonel or a brigadier, the land that they give you makes, makes it worthwhile to just keep your friggin' mouth shut, right? So the way in which armies indoctrinate and through their constant evaluation process, through promotion and evaluation, you can make an argument that you can see these things with some continuity playing out over multiple generations of, of officers. And this is why armies are very conservative. I don't mean conservative politically, I mean conservative in the sense that they're very slow to change. But every once in a while, there'll be an, an important exogenous shock. Like an exogenous shock in the US military was that for whatever reason, a lot of our Arabic translators were gay. And we did this really dumb thing called invade Iraq. And boy, it came really hard to maintain our Islamophobia when we needed these gay translators. So my brothers are actually army recruiters. And for him, he, he went from being a homophobe to being, I don't care as long as they're in boots, sign them up. So there are these exogenous things that happen that make militaries rethink virtually overnight what they're doing. Um, and arguably, that was one of the things that affected the US military. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that are affecting the POC military in a second. And we can also talk about what's really exogenous versus endogenous, if you really want to go down that route. OK, I'm not going to go there. All right, so the other thing that makes this project more doable than, say, an India project, if I did this looking at Indian Army strategic cultural materials, it wouldn't tell me much. Why is that? Because the Indian Army is relatively useless as a power player. So in an American setting, when, we were, when I was a kid at Thanksgiving, all the adults sat at the big table, and we kids sat at the card table putting olives on our fingers. That's the Indian Army. It's the card table, olives on the finger. So it does not have any role in apex decision making. right? It just doesn't. And, and there's historical reasons for that. Um, India is probably going to have to change that if it really wants to be a serious projector of power. But then India has debates within its own institutions about what it means to project power. So if I were to, or even if I were to do this looking at um, American army publications, our army has a lot of influence in the policy making because they've got lobbies in Congress. They have powerful stakeholders in the Department of Defense, unlike the Ministry of Defense, which doesn't really have any stake uh, to play uh, in the Indian political setup. It still wouldn't give me a very good predictor of what American or Indian policy would be because our armies really don't set those policy courses. We probably do so more than the Indians. But I'd have to look, I'd have to think about strategic culture very differently, right? I'd look at Congress in the case of the Americans, I'd look at the, the Department of Defense, I'd have to look at those wieners in the State Department. Um, it'd be a much more complicated picture. But because most countries have an army, but the Pakistan army has a country, many of these things are things that we care about actually simplify very nicely. So terrorism, POC military. Even if Nawaz Sharif decided he didn't like terrorists, by the way, he does like terrorists. He's all the time fruiting about with Lashkar Jungvi. Um, they're you know, political allies of sorts. Even if Nawaz Sharif were to decide that Lashkar Taiba is a menace, he really can't do anything about it, right? Um, so things that we care about with respect to Afghanistan, India, the United States, Saudi Arabia, China, these are all things that the army exclusively controls. I think the Pakistani Ministry of Exterior of, of, uh, of Foreign Affairs might control, I don't know, Pakistan Palau relationships. I, I really don't know what those diplomats do. But for most things that we care about, the Pak army is in the driver's seat. So we can reduce the strategic culture of Pakistan to a first order approximation to what the Pakistan army privileges the way it thinks, what it wants to do, and most importantly, how it wants to accomplish these things that it wants to do. Um, so I don't know if there's any Monty Python likers in this audience, but it's the Black Knight. It's just a flesh wound, 
right? You know that scene? It's just a flesh wound. Yeah, this is Pakistan. I mean, 47, 48, 65, 99, half the country, and 71, it's just a flesh wound. Um, so why does it do what it does? So let me just sort of walk you through some of the things that come out of this review of Pakistan's literature, and it's gonna go back to this Kashmir issue, so I'm sorry to belabor this point, but it's really important. Where Pakistan is probably on the firmest footing is on its complaints about, about partition. So for those of you who know about partition, I apologize, I have to unpack this for a few minutes. Um, you have to sort of think about how the British colonized South Asia. So the Brits first roll up in Calcutta in what, the 1500s. So think about that. By the time Pakistan is independent, the Punjab was incorporated into the British Empire right before the mutiny in 1857, right? NWFP did not have a provincial assembly until 1901. In the elections for which many Muslims voted for Pakistan, although they didn't know what they were voting for, there was no provincial assembly in Balochistan, so Balochistan didn't get a vote, right? Sindh was also a relatively late acquisition to the Raj. So what does this mean in real terms? Now, there was also this thing called East Pakistan, which actually did have a lot of experience with democratic institutions, but the West Pakistani elites were racist and they had very nasty views about their, their Bengali um, co-nationalists co and decided to exclude them from the making of the state. And that was actually to Pakistan's peril. I like to, to think about a thought experiment. What if, rather than denigrating the fact that a majority of Pakistanis in 47 were Bengali, Right? And, and following the demographics, they chose the national language to be Bengali. And following with the center of demographic gravity, the capital was set up at Dhaka. Right? What kind of Pakistan would we have? Right? Well, that's not the Pakistan that we got. So instead what we got was the, the propounders of Pakistan, the Muslim League, they had all of their political center in North India. Right? So when they actually showed up in West Pakistan, literally no one spoke their language. They spoke Urdu. There was no native Urdu speakers in Pakistan. In fact, people in NWFP didn't even want to be a part of Pakistan. They wanted to stay with India. Large squads of Balochistan, 60% of West Pakistan's territory, didn't want to be a part of India. Good portion of folks in Sindh didn't want to be a part of India. In the Punjab, you basically had um, sort of a, a leftist coalition that was pan-communal, right? So the whole communal appeal of the, the unionists. The communal appeal of Muslims and Hindus being um, invariably unable to live together had no appeal until partition began to be real and the communal violence began. So basically, uh, the Muslim League had this enormous task before it. They were going to show up in a place where literally uh, no one speaks their language. They have no political standing. So the example I give to my American classes um, a, a, a rump fraction of the Tea Party, this is also called My Good Day, decides to go to Kebaswa, Canada and, and open up shop. I mean, can you, it's not even possible, right? They don't speak the same language, literally. Yet this was the task, in many ways, that the Muslim League had. And at the same time, going back to the bum deal that Pakistan got for partition, and going back to, you have to think about how the British consolidated power as they moved east to west. What, what was the part that became West Pakistan had very little experience with democratic self-governance. All the institutionalization of democratic, well, the, the institutions of democracy and governance largely remained within India, right? The Indian Administrative Service stayed in India. The, the Indian Military Academy, guess what, stayed in India. And there had never been any history of ruling this part of Pakistan, this part of South Asia, from Karachi. So, if you sort of go through and look at some of the accounts of the very early efforts to set up a state, the Ministry of External Affairs were literally sitting on crates. They didn't even have pens and paper, right? So the Muslim League had to make a decision. Do we build up our party or do we build the state? And they had to build the state. So this is an impossible decision from the beginning. On top of that, um, India was supposed to, because of course they, was, they held the basically the holding of debt, but also the holding of resources, India was supposed to make a financial transfer to Pakistan, and India said, go to hell. Why did they say go to hell? Because Pakistan sent those little militants into Kashmir. Why, from India's point of view, are we going to give you money when you started a war with us? 
So India had absolutely no interest. Um, India also was very problematic in terms of um, breaking up the military. So there's a whole history of Pakistan thinking that the process of partition, leave aside the issue of Kashmir, was inherently unfair to it. And as I said, there's reasonable grounds there for Pakistan to, to, to have. When people talk about Pakistan <coughs> being a failed state, I actually don't think it's a failed state. I actually think it's a miracle that it didn't fail. Because it's sort of like that, that twin that like was born, you know, growing off of a shoulder, and the doctor just cut it off thinking it was like going to die, but it crawled out of the trash can and lived. Um, that's really, that was the experience of Pakistan going through partition. It's, you have to really appreciate that the place didn't just collapse. In fact, many Indians thought it would collapse and fall back into India. So this notion that partition was unfair persists throughout their literature in a way that it's, you cannot underestimate it. This is tied to a second issue, strategic depth. Right? Many people think that strategic depth was a new concept. It came with Zia, it came with the Afghan Jihad. It's not true. They inherited strategic depth from the British. So the way in which the British set up the Indian defense infrastructure, I'm talking about United India, it was to manage two competing um, imperial frontiers. Right? To the north and east, it was China. And to the north and west, it was Russia. And so from Pakistan's point of view, it inherited the, the most dangerous of those threat frontiers, right? because every invader that came to South Asia came through Afghanistan with a fraction of the resources. Now, what's interesting is Pakistan retained that relationship with the Northwest Frontier Province, Northwest, Fro Northwest Frontier Province of the Raj, until just a few years ago, when they finally changed its name to Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. India also inherited a similar frontier buffer agency called the Northeast Frontier Agency. And Nehru said, screw this, no more buffer states. And he began incorporating them in and mainstreaming them into the rest of India. We can debate how well they did that, because there's many insurgencies that have existed in India's uh, various uh, Northeast, it's called the, the Seven Sisters. But Pakistan retained this colonial era of governance. And it still does, right? That's the frontier crimes regulation. So this idea of strategic depth goes back basically before partition. But we have to understand is how it evolved. So Pakistan becomes independent. Um, Soviet Union is already communist. Ayub Khan hates the communists, but it's an interesting story how nonetheless he opens up to China. He actually, the backstory there is actually quite interesting. He was also, he hated the communists. He actually proposed to the Indians a mutual defense pact against the Chinese. Nehru said no. Um, why do we need a mutual, a, a mutual defense pact against the Chinese? So Nehru actually wasn't as smart as he thought he was. So you can do another interesting counterfactual, right? What if Nehru said, you know, that's actually not a bad idea, Ayub. Let's think about that, right? The entire geopolitics of South Asia could have been really quite different. But it doesn't matter. Nehru said, no, bugger off, and, and we are where we are. Um, so this, and then think about how alliance politics shapes this frontier, right? So Pakistan begged and pleaded to be sucked into America's alliance policy. We were actually initially very hesitant. Um, we had no interest until the, Korea, until the Korean War, in which case our, our calculus began to change. Note my vocabulary. Pakistan begged and pleaded to become a US partner. And we, for many years, said no. Um, reasons for that was we had no interest in South Asia. Right? We were still dealing with the Marshall Plan. And the first time Pakistan asked for money, I think the, I, I, I got the number in the book, they asked for like one-fifth of the total sum of the entire Marshall Plan. I mean, I just showed you how crazy the Pakistanis were uh, in terms of misunderstanding where our priorities were. It wasn't until the Korean War when we decided that we had to stop outsourcing um, our Middle East policy to South Asia. So Pakistan becomes allied with us, as do the Iranians, right? Um, who does India become allied with? Well, India says, they are not allies, but of course they became very close with the Soviet Union. Um, and this puts Afghanistan in a very weird place, right? The Americans wanted to engage in aid in Afghanistan, but the Pakistanis said, no, how can you do this? Well, why were the Pakistanis resistant to aid to Afghanistan? Well, another story. Um, Afghanistan was the only state to vote against Pakistan's inclusion in the United Nations, right? Pakistan, um, the border, the, the, the boundary that separates Pakistan from Afghanistan, the Durand Line, Afghanistan rejects. And they also had irredentist claims on large swaths of Pakistani territory, inclusive of parts of Balochistan, Fatah, and WFP, right? And they also even sent troops into Pakistan in 1954, I believe it was. So Pakistan's issues with Afghanistan were real and on their own terms. But as India and Pakistan 
became sucked into these different alliance structures, so did Afghanistan by default. So Pakistan says no aid to Afghanistan, they are our enemy. And so Afghanistan, for those of you who may know, was also a rentier state. So when Afghanistan uh, sent the British packing, someone had to pay their bills, and the, the Russians were very happy to oblige. Once Afghanistan becomes a Russian partner, India becomes linked in this Pakistani imaginary to Afghanistan. And in fact, during Zahir Shah's time, there were hundreds of Indians in his palace. So from Pakistan's point of view, this idea of strategic depth is not only, it slowly emerges from a place where the Russians are sneaking across to being a place where India was an Indian hiding under every rock. And it's important to understand that Pakistan's neuroses about this cannot be understated. And now, from my point of view, how do you handle this? How do you handle a neuroses? Because all the evidence in the world, look, no Indians are under this rock, right? Um, but in point of fact, the Americans have never really collected evidence about what the Indians are doing or not. We, what we've largely have said to them is, thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. Oh, by the way, we think you're full of crap, right? So this isn't necessarily the best way of handling this. Um, and of course, on the other hand, the Indians are not as innocent as they say they are, right? So this is another case where there's always going to be some incident that allows Pakistan to justify these bizarre conspiracies about an Indian hiding in every rock in Afghanistan. But this idea of strategic depth, you must understand, it is enduring. It's why they would rather have the Taliban in power than have a stable Afghanistan. Because in their mind, a stable Afghanistan is not going to be allied to Pakistan. It never has been. A stable Afghanistan is going to be allied with India. So they would always prefer a chaos in Afghanistan that they have a better chance of managing. Right? It's better for them to manage chaos than it is to manage at status quo um, a stable Afghanistan allied to India. So this is exactly the preference that they have pursued. They've pursued it in different ways, using different partners, but this is the outcome that they have generally uh, pursued for, for decades. This isn't recent. The next important thing that comes out of this review, and I hinted at it um, from the opening slide, is that their literature consistently depicts India as Hindu. Um, you can go to Halal, which is now on the web, ISPR, go to their green books. They have these really interesting fantasies that, um, uh, that Bollywood, which is the, the Indian film industry, there's also other languages like Tamil, but, but Bollywood is what the Pakistanis generally know because Hindi has so much similarity to Urdu. Um, they actually wrote in the last green book that Bollywood is a raw, raw is India's intelligence, it's a raw plot to culturally hegemonize Pakistanis. Um, and this lovely, thoughtful brigadier was complaining how his daughter wants to wear a bindi, and this is all a raw plot. Um, there are other plots that derive from Indian popular culture, but this is all about colonizing Pakistan, taking away its Muslimness, and replacing its Muslimness with Hinduness. Now, why is this important that India is Hindu? Well, depicted as Hindu, even though if you just look at the demographic of the military, um, there's a lot of Sikhs in there too, but um, you, don't let, you don't want to let facts get in the way of a good Pakistani conspiracy theory. Um, going back to the two-nation theory, right, if Pakistan is Muslim and India is Hindu, and the two-nation theory upon which Pakistan is built says that these two cannot meet, this is a civilizational war, right? This is a war that has no end. And when they promote this in Pakistan's public schools and in the media, what they're basically doing is prepping the population for a conflict that is interminable. Now, this also has a materialist benefit, right? If you're the Pakistan army and you want to run and ruin the country at your leisure, the way you do this is that you set yourself up as the sole institution to protect your country's equities in perpetuity. So, whether, so this is what they call in political science um, equifinality, right? You've got different explanations that put you at the exact same place. So whether we use the ideological argument that I've made or simply a materialist argument that says the Pakistan army does this because it benefits them, we come to the same place. And that is that there's always going to be a spoiler, right? Whenever there's even a hint of political rapprochement between these two countries. The army is, is going to get in the way. So um, I'm going to end with it's just a flesh wound. Um, but I've got lots of other you know, data that if it comes up in the Q&A that I can talk about. Is that OK?